Hi guys, in this video we're going to be looking at tensile forces, compressive forces, Hooke's law, elastic limit and we're going to finish with a summary. We're going to start off by talking about a certain kind of force which is called a tensile force. Consider hanging a mass on a spring. So we can see here that this is our spring and we've attached a mass to it. We find that the spring immediately stretches, extending it beyond its natural length. So before we apply the mass, this is the natural length of the spring. So we're going to measure that from the middle of the mass here. So we've applied the mass, but let's imagine that we're holding the mass and we haven't let it go to extend the spring yet. So the spring has got its natural length. Now, once we release the mass, we can see that the spring now has an extension. So if we're measuring again from the middle of the mass, we can see that there is an extension x. So by applying this mass to the spring, we've stretched it, it's gotten longer. The force which causes the spring to extend is called a tensile force. So the original length of the spring was around here. So we can see that the spring now has an extension x. And this is because by applying the mass, we've now created a tensile force that's acting on the spring. And this tensile force is due to the weight of the mass. And we know that the weight of an object is given by its mass, m, times the gravitational acceleration, g. So that's the weight of the mass, and that's what's created the tensile force on the spring that's stretched it. Removing the mass will cause the spring to return to its natural length since there is no longer a tensile force causing it to stretch. So this is our extended spring, and that's because of the tensile force from the mass that we've applied. So the force comes from the mass. So that means that once we remove the mass, there's no tensile force acting on the spring. So we've got no tensile force now. The tensile force was coming from the weight of the mass. So that means if we've got no tensile force, then there's no force pulling the spring. So the spring is just going to return to its natural length. Other examples of a tensile force include pulling on a guitar string or pulling back on a bow and arrow. So for example, here we can consider the tensile force applied to a guitar string. So in order to create a sound by using a guitar, we need to pluck the string. So to pluck the string, a tensile force is applied to the string in order to stretch it. And by stretching the guitar string, we're able to pluck it and to create the sound. So now if we look at our other example with the bow and arrow, we can see that here we have an unstretched bow. And then in order to fire the arrow, we need to stretch the bow string backwards. So that's what we can see is happening here. The bow string has been stretched. So in order to stretch it, we need to apply tensile force. So it's the same as the spring. To stretch the spring, we applied the mass because that provided a tensile force. So a tensile force is applied. So that enables us to pull back the bow string and fire the arrow. So now we're going to look at another type of forces, and these are compressive forces, which are essentially the opposite of a tensile force. We can reduce the length of a spring by squashing it. So in the previous slide, we saw how we can increase the length of the spring by stretching it and applying a tensile force. But now we're going to reduce the length of the spring. So this is our natural length. And then we can see that the length here has been reduced. And this is because in order to go to this squashed spring, we've had to apply a compressive force. So this force is applied on either end of the spring in order to squash it. 
So in this case, we apply a force called a compressive force. So here, where the spring is at its natural length, there are no forces acting on it. And then in order to squash the spring, we need to apply compressive forces. So the compressive forces reduce the length of the spring. And just like the removal of a tensile force allowed the spring to return to its natural length, the removal of the compressive force will result in the spring returning to its original length. So the same thing happens when you remove a compressive force. So here we have our squashed spring because of the compressive forces. And now we're going to remove the forces and we can see that from this reduced length, the spring has returned back to its original length. And that's because the compressive forces have been removed. So it was the compressive forces that were responsible for the reduced length of the spring. So by removing them, the length returns to normal. Another example is when a car goes over a bumpy road. The suspension springs in the car are compressed. So when the car goes over a bump in the road, like the bump here, it experiences a compressive force because the bump is at a higher level than the level road. And because of this compressive force, the suspension springs in the car are squashed. So this is a real life example of when springs are squashed due to a compressive force. So now that we've seen that how we can vary the length of a spring by using compressive or tensile forces, we're going to look at something called Hooke's law, which relates the force applied to a spring to its extension. We can investigate how the length of a spring changes with different masses attached to a spring. So for example, here we're applying one mass and this results in a small extension. However, when we apply two masses, as we have in the second image, we can see we get a much larger extension. So by increasing the mass, we've increased the extension. So there must be some link here. This is because changing the mass on a spring allows us to change the tensile force on the spring. So when we have one mass, we have a tensile force acting on the spring F, and this is due to the weight of the mass. And this tensile force F creates an extension, but this is a small extension. And it's a small extension because when we compare it to the spring with two masses, so we've now increased the mass, and by increasing the mass, we've also increased the tensile force F. And the reason we've increased F by increasing the mass is because the tensile force is due to the weight of the masses. And we know that the weight of an object is equal to its mass times the gravitational acceleration G. So W is equal to mg. So therefore, by increasing the mass, we increase the force. And then we can see here that with a larger force, we also get a larger extension. So we get a larger X. But what's the relation between increasing the mass and the greater extension? Well, we find that the force needed to stretch a spring is directly proportional to the extension of the spring. So when we apply a tensile force F to a spring and we stretch it, so it now has an extension, the force F that we apply is actually directly proportional to the extension X. We define this as Hooke's law, with k representing the spring constant. So we can write this relation of proportionality as an equation by saying that F, the force applied to the spring, is equal to kx. So k here is our constant of proportionality. So this equation shows us Hooke's law. So F here is the force applied. K is our constant of proportionality, and this is the spring constant. And the spring constant is unique to all springs, and it depends on their material and how they're made. And then X is the extension of the spring due to the force applied.
the spring constant is used to represent the stiffness of the spring. So that's what K tells us. It tells us how stiff a spring is. So the stiffness of the spring is given by K. And K has units newtons per metre. And these units come from our equation for Hooke's law. So we can see from our equation that K is equal to F divided by the extension. And we know F has the units newtons and that length or the extension X has the units metres, which is how we get these units newtons per metre. And the higher K is, the more stiff the spring is. So an increased K means more stiffness. And we can see this from this equation here. So we can see that K is inversely proportional to X. So if we apply the same force F to different types of springs with different spring constants, we can see a greater K will mean a smaller X because they're inversely proportional. So that's why a higher K means a stiffer spring because it has a smaller extension. For example, what is the force needed to extend a spring with spring constant of five newtons per meter by 0 0.1 meters? So we've write down our equation from Hooke's law, so F is equal to Kx, and we now substitute in our numbers. So we've been told that K has value 5 newtons per metre, and we're going to multiply this by the extension, which is 0 0.1 metres. So this then gives us the force that's needed to extend this spring by 0 0.1 metres, and that is 0 0.5 newtons. So, so far we've been looking at the behaviour of a spring when a tensile or a compressive force is applied to it. So we're going to look at something related to a spring's behaviour and that's its elastic limit. Consider stretching a spring. It will regain its shape after we remove the force. So for example here we've applied a mass, so there's a tensile force acting on the spring and this tensile force causes it to extend. So we've got an extension, x. However, if we then remove the mass, there is now no force acting on the spring. And that's because the source of the force is the mass's weight. So no mass means no weight and therefore no force. And when there's no force, we can see that the spring returns to its natural length. So in this case, we say that the spring is behaving elastically. So what we mean by elastic behaviour is that when you apply a load to a spring or a material and it extends, and then you remove the load, it returns back to its original natural length. So that's what we're saying this spring here is doing, so it, it displays elastic behaviour. However, if we continue to stretch the spring by increasing the load, the spring may no longer return to its original length. So now we've increased the load further and we've added three masses. And because these masses create a tensile force on the spring, the spring extends. So it's got an extension X. And now we're going to remove the mass again. However, the spring is still extended. It's still got an extension. It hasn't returned to its natural length. The force, however, is equal to zero. There's no mass on the spring, so therefore there's no longer a weight force and a tensile force acting on it. So the force is zero. However, we can clearly see that the extension is not zero. There's still an extension to the spring. It hasn't returned to its natural length. So now we say that the spring is no longer elastic. And this is because after removing the force, it hasn't returned back to its original length. So it's no longer obeying Hooke's law, because f equals zero hasn't returned a zero extension. So in this case, we say that the spring has reached its elastic limit and is permanently deformed. So the elastic limit is the maximum force that can be applied to a spring such that the spring returns to its natural length when the force is removed. So if we apply a force 
past the elastic limit, then the spring won't return to its natural length, so it's not behaving elastically anymore. And this might also happen if you were to break an elastic band, for example. So if you break an elastic band, it's permanently deformed. It won't suddenly come back together and have its natural length. So we can see that by stretching it to this extent, you've stretched it beyond the elastic limit. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level physics resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised smiley face and together let's make A-level physics a walk in the park.